Welcome to Spine Academy. In this surgical technique video, we're going to talk about my technique for placing a C2 PARS screw. I find the C2 PAR screw to be an extremely valuable and versatile screw, and we'll talk about the technique for actually placing one safely and accurately. However, it is important to mention that C2 is a very complicated structure, and there are other types of screws that can be placed into C2 as well. Here is an illustration that shows a PARS screw. So you can see again, this is a top-down three-dimensional view of just C2. Here you can see the odontoid, you can see the superior articular processes. Here's the lamina and spinous process. And the PARS is on the side of the spinal canal, and it is the structure between the superior articular process that you can see here and the inferior articular process, which is down here, kind of deep to the, to the image. This structure is called the pars interarticularis, which is short, for short what we call pars, and this is the versatile screw we're going to talk about here. It is important to also understand there's another trajectory called the pedicle screw, which is a longer screw that goes from lateral to medial, much more medialization on it. Its start point, as a consequence, is a little further lateral, but the length of it and the triangulation really gives it a fair amount of strength. I use this screw less frequently because of the proximity to the vertebral artery, which you can't see on this image, but sits right here. It's a little bit more in jeopardy, and often if I'm doing a C2 part pedicle screw, I will use navigation for that. The other reason I don't love it is because it doesn't necessarily line up so cleanly with particularly subaxial screws at C3 and below. It tends to be quite lateral. Not to say that it doesn't have its utility, but those are the reasons I don't use it as my workhorse C2 fixation. The last type of screw into C2 that's relevant is C2 laminar screws. So this illustration shows where they go. They go right down the lamina, the full length, and you can get a 28, even 30, 26 millimeter, quite a long screw that you can get in. You can put them in on both sides so they cross. They're excellent for pullout strength, and of course, they're quite far from all the structures, the vertebral artery, the vertebral body up front. I find this to be a very useful technique in some situations, but I don't use it as my workhorse because in my mind, there are two problems with it. One of them is that these screws tend to be quite superficial, and so they tend to sometimes be prominent in an elderly person or somebody with a thin neck. You can sometimes feel these screws. They're a little bit harder to connect up to your construct. And the other reason is because you need to have a lamina intact, so you can't have done a laminectomy at that level, and it needs to be large enough to permit not just one, but two screws. And so I find that to be something I will use on occasion or maybe as a supplemental fixation on top of PAR screws, but not as the primary mode of fixation at C2. For me, the C2 PAR screw is the most versatile and valuable of the techniques available. Certainly we will learn all of these techniques in videos to come, but in this surgical technique video, we'll talk about my technique for placing a C2 PARS screw. In this video, we're going to talk about the surgical technique for placing C2 PARS screws. So as I mentioned earlier, the PARS screw is one of three different types of screws that you can place in the C2 vertebral body. In my opinion, it's probably the most versatile or useful of the three techniques. Of course, that's personal opinion. Uh, I find it lines up beautifully with the screws above and below it and find that it's the screw that I use the most. To be able to put it in well and safely, it's really imperative that you understand some of the structures around it because C2 is an unusually shaped, very unique vertebral body. So if you look at an image of the cervical spine from the front, you can see that the C1 vertebral body is up here, this is C2, and it's such a unique shape because this is the body itself, the vertebral body, and there's this process up here called the odontoid process. The C1 ring spins on top of that and allows for a lot of rotation of your neck. Most of that motion comes from the top. So some people call the odontoid the axis of the spine, and that's because your head rotates around it. So this odontoid process is called the axis, and sometimes the vertebral body itself is called the axis. The spine below that is called the subaxial cervical spine, and you can see here three, four, five, et cetera, all the way down, those bodies look very similar. 
So now as we rotate the spine here, if you imagine that the spine kind of coming around from the side, here's C2 in the odontoid, you can see some important structures around it. You can see the vertebral arteries kind of coming up right next to where the par screw is gonna go. You can see the posterior arch here, the lamina, the spinous process, a very pronounced spinous process that is bifid, which means it has two heads to it, so to speak. You can see how this structure right here is the pars and the bone above it is the C1 bone. If you were to rotate this just a little bit backwards to get a three-quarter view of it, you get this very interesting view of the pars itself. Here it connects up the posterior arch, this area which is called the inferior articular process, which articulates with the C3 bone below it. And then if you look forward, it's the C2 superior articular process, which uh, articulates with the C1 lateral mass. So, What's interesting about the pars is that its full name is the pars interarticularis. Pars interarticularis is a Latin phrase that means simply the part between the articulations. And it makes sense now, right? This is the pars interarticularis because here's one articular surface, the superior articular process, and here's the inferior articular process. So it's a very unique in that it's offset. Now, if you were to keep rolling this around, you could see again the screw would go right into that. And a good start point for it is right where this red dot is. You can see that the start point would be kind of right here, which allows you to go into the pars here. That red dot will line up very nicely with some of the screws that go down below it. This is the C3 level, C4 level, and if you were to go up, it would articulate nicely with the screw that would go into C1 here. So this, this dot is gonna be right about here, kind of midpoint between the top of the pars and the bottom of the articular process, the inferior articular process. Now as you roll this from the side, you can see again that this is the pars right here. The dot will appear kind of midway between the top here, the, par, the top of the pars, and the bottom of this inferior articular process. So that is a good start point. So now as you see a screw that comes in here, you can see that its start point would be right about here. That screw will go up a longer trajectory that's parallel to the pars here. It looks like you're aiming right at the vertebral artery, but this is where you're gonna steer a little bit medially. So you'll see the screw as it goes in, you keep it a little bit shorter, and the reason it's shorter is just so you're not flirting too aggressively with the vertebral artery. If you roll it to the back here, from a back view, you can see that the screw really kind of medializes a little bit, principally to steer away from the vertebral artery. So this is one of the screws that I tell people unusually uh, or, or uniquely that if you had to breach on a C2 par screw, you'd prefer to breach medial over breaching lateral. And that's because there's a little more tolerance here than here in terms of injuring a structure. Now obviously you're not trying to breach at all, but you can see this medialization kind of highlighted from this view back here. And a C2 pars is a paired structure, so there are screws that you put in on both sides. So here you can see as this screw comes in from a posterior view that when it goes in, it's medialized a little bit, and that just illustrates that you're trying to stay away from the vertebral artery. And here you can kind of see it going into the, into the pars itself. So it's a paired structure, and you can see that these tulips would line up really nicely in terms of being collinear, so you could drop your rods very easily with subaxial screws and or C1 lateral mass screws. Now if you keep rolling this image to the side, you can kind of see that the screw itself ascends parallel to the pars. I usually am looking directly at the pars, as I'll show you in the cadaver dissection today. Looking at the top of the pars and just following it with the trajectory of my pilot hole, my tap, and my screw. I don't usually use fluoroscopy for placing this because I feel like you can see all of the relevant structures, but you can, and in the cadaver model I did just to illustrate some points. The length of the screw is usually limited by the proximity of the vertebral artery. And that is something that's worth measuring on a CAT scan beforehand. I find that for the most part, I tend to put in 16 or 18 millimeter screws. You really can't go wrong. A 14 millimeter screw is very safe. Some people will put in longer screws, but this is not a 28 or 30 millimeter screw like you might see with a pedicle screw. And again, we'll talk about that technique separately. Today, we're gonna to talk specifically about the surgical technique for putting in C2 PARS screws.
So the first thing we have to do when we're putting in a C2 PAR screw or really any screw is understand the structures around you and really properly visualize the PARs so that you know how to safely put it in. So if you look at this illustration from the back, you can see again, this should be familiar to you, C1 at the top, this is C2 here. You can see the spinous process of C2, the lamina here, and then the PARs on one side. And then if you wrap it around the same thing, here's the PARs over here. Now, when you're putting in C2 fixation, you usually have screws at some of the adjacent structures. Most of the time, it's subaxial fixation, ending at C2 as a terminal screw. Sometimes you'll get fixation to C1, and this kind of illustrates what you'd be looking at for that. Now, in general, since you're putting these screws in with subaxial screws, I usually will start my exposure for C2 by verifying that I know exactly where I'm gonna be putting in these lateral mass screws. And these dots will really show you the center of this rectangle. Now, we're not talking much about the technique for putting in lateral mass screws, so much as to say that the lateral mass is this structure, and then right at the midpoint of it where these red dots are, that's where those lateral mass screws would enter. Now, in order to keep your C2 screws collinear with that, I kind of mark those out. Depending on how many levels are going, I, I might even do three, four, five, multiple of those levels. And then once I have done that, I'll identify a start point for C2 to keep it in line. Again, it's gonna be around the midpoint from the top of the PARs to the bottom of the IAP. That's usually a good start point for the PARs. And then that screw is gonna go from here into the PARs there, kind of medializing it just a little bit. Now, if you look at it in a cadaver dissection, you'll have the structures around it exposed. So this is, again, looking at it from a posterior approach, much as you would during placement in surgery. Here's the spinous process. Here's the midline here. You can see the left and the right, or both sides are exposed here. You can see the subaxial spine below that. So this is C3, this is C4 below it. Now, I've already marked out in the cadaver what I think is a good start point on this side for a lateral mass screw. And one of the things that I do when I'm putting these in is really define a couple of the borders. I'm looking at this junction between the lamina and the lateral mass, looking at the lateral edge of the lateral mass, the top and bottom of it here, and then really identifying what I think is gonna be a good start point for, in this case, a C3 lateral mass screw. Once I've done that and I've gotten everything laid out, so here I've also exposed C1, you can see the C2 root over here, you can see the lamina, and this is right about where you expect the pars to be. So now, when I, once I've laid all that out, then I'll really come in and expose this structure well. I usually use a Penfield one for this to expose the top of the lamina to the top of the pars that you can see exposed here. Sometimes you're pushing that C2 root rostrally, but you really wanna be able to see the top of it and see the medial edge of the pars before you put the screw in. This is kind of the exposure that you need before you actually put your C2 PAR screw in. Next, we'll talk about the technique for putting the PAR screw in itself. So before we get into actually placing the screw, I think there are a couple of interesting topographical landmarks that we really don't talk about a whole lot except in the operating room. I wanna use this opportunity to kind of highlight that teaching point. So again, if you look at this image, this is looking at the spine from the back. So again, this is C2 here. These are the start points that we made for the C3 lateral mass screws. And the surface I wanna talk about is really here. So if you imagine that we're gonna extrapolate this line up and your start point is gonna be right around here for your C2 par screw, let's say we took a sagittal slice or a parasagittal slice right through that structure. That would help us understand what the contour here is. Again, the pars is here. This is the back aspect of C2 and our screw is gonna go there. So if you were to follow the pars all the way ventrally, you would get to the superior articular process of C2. So let's just say that that looks flat. And again, above that is where the C1, cond the, the C1 lateral mass would sit. The condyle would be here. This would be the posterior arch there. This is C1. So this is the C2 superior articular process. So the pars comes off of that. So that's a structure that looks like this. And then the back wall, so again, our screw is gonna go into this. The back wall of C2 has some interesting topology to it. It kind of turns the corner here and you get something that looks a bit like this. So this is the back wall of what you're looking at. So just to understand that this here is this structure that we're looking at from exposed from here, the proximal aspect of the pars, all the way to the inferior articular process. So that is, this is again the pars, this is the surface that we're looking at right there. There's two points of inflection on this contour. One of them is right about here, 
This is where you go from the posterior aspect of C2 to the pars, and I'll exaggerate it by almost making it look like an angle. And then there's another point of inflection, which is about midway from top to bottom between the, the back of, of the C2 pars and this inferior articular process of C2. This is where your screw is gonna go in. So if you imagine putting a screw in there, ideally you again want it to track along the pars. So the screw trajectory is gonna look something like this. So this is gonna be your screw, this is gonna be the, 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 the threads themselves, and they're gonna enter right about here. Now, one thing about putting screws in is it's not always that easy to get screws to go in obliquely along a surface. So if you imagine having a surface like this, very easy to put a screw in when the screw is perpendicular to the surface. But if you were to come in here and say, no, no, I wanna put a screw like this, that screw tends to skip in this direction, right? So here, if you imagine coming in with your drill, it wants to skip. If you start it too high, it wants to skip along this rostral portion of it because this angle here is quite small. So I tend to start my start point just below that point of inflection, if at all possible. And that's to kind of increase how orthogonal or how perpendicular my screw is to the surface that I'm putting it into. So I typically will make my start point right about here. Now, if you take this image, this is again looking at it from the side and imagine it here, you can see those points of inflection. Here the pars starts here. You can see the top of that posterior aspect of C2. This is region one, this kind of area right there. This area that's right over here, that is this area from here to here. And then there's this point of inflection that I couldn't even get the soft tissue off of because it changes contour there to an area that's a little bit flatter and a little bit more parallel to the back of C3. That's this area here. I try to make my start point just below that so that the screw doesn't skip towards the pars and rostrally out of that. Whenever I put these screws in, I come into that. If you imagine again this structure here, if I wanna get a screw to go in like this, I will start my screw kind of coming in like this, get a few threads in, and then redirect it. And you'll see that maneuver happening throughout the course of this cadaveric dissection. So now let's dive right into actually placing the C2 pars screw. So once again, if you look at this uh, image, this shows, again, the posterior view of C2. And again, you can see C3 here. Just to reorient you, this is the start point for a lateral mass screw at C3 on both sides here. This is the spinous process. We're looking at one side. This is the posterior aspect of C2 and the pars right there. So once we have those structures reoriented and kind of laid out, then I really will start with a 1.7 millimeter drill bit Here's that point of inflection I was pointing to before. And I'll make a start point that's kind of collinear with the screw below. I use that same drill bit to a depth of 15, which is the length of the bit, to go right into the pars and then check an x-ray. And that will give you a sense of the trajectory. And you can see here how it follows that superior aspect of the pars. And of course it does, right? Because we can see it here and that was intentional. So once I've made the start point with the 1.7 millimeter drill bit, I typically will put in the contralateral pilot hole so that there's nothing obscuring us on an x-ray. So here you can see with the Woodson, you can see the top aspect of the pars. You can see the top of the lamina as it meets the pars there. This would again be the start point. You can bring in a nerve hook and really feel that medial edge of the pars there. So our start point here would once again line up pretty nicely with the one below. Again, here's that point of inflection. We want to keep it in the same kind of medial lateral collinear kind of corridor as the screws above or below it, and then see the pars. So I would come in once again with a 1.7 millimeter drill bit. I'd make my start point once again collinear right at that point of inflection. Look right at the pars. So again, I'm looking at the medial and the rostral edge of it, and then cannulate it. Same 1.7 millimeter drill bit. I make my pilot hole with it. You can see it here kind of going right in and I do this in vivo. We'll check an x-ray to make sure we like that uh, quarter as well. So you can see again the pilot hole. This is 15 millimeters that are purchased. That's about the full length that you can get with a 1.7 millimeter drill bit. Once that is done, I'll come in with my tap. And usually I'll take a ball tip probe and make sure I have a floor there. But then if I want a longer screw than 14 or 15 millimeters, I usually will take a tap further, 16 or 18, depending on how much of purchase I really expect to get. 
that will of course be dictated completely by the distance I am from the vertebral artery, which I will have studied on a CT beforehand. And then with my tap all the way down, I'll check an x-ray to make sure I like the trajectory and the length of it before actually putting my screw in. So the tap, one of the things you'll notice is it's a Christmas tree, it's a conical tap, and its function is really one, to get the correct depth, but two, to expand that pilot hole, because a 1.7 millimeter drill bit, a little bit of chatter will give you a two millimeter pilot hole, but not big enough to put a 3.5 millimeter screw in. So that conical tap will be three millimeters in maximal dimension, to help open up that pilot hole to permit a 3.5 millimeter screw to come in. So now I'll check with the Baltic probe, make sure that I'm happy with the depth of it, and that I still have a floor there and then come back in with a screw. So the next maneuver, once I've done that, is to come in with a screw. This is usually a single lead screw. I usually will start this screw kind of perpendicular, as close to perpendicular to get some bite, some purchase, because you can see here how it would not be hard for it to skive off the top. We want to kind of get it started. Once I've got secure purchase and I've anchored the start point, then I will come in with something to see the top and the medial aspect of the pars and put this screw in directly looking at the pars the whole time. So because it's single lead, it takes a little bit longer to get a 16 or an 18 millimeter screw in. Once you've got it seated all the way, I will check an x-ray to make sure that I'm happy with the position of it and that it's really along the right quarter. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I don't always use fluoroscopy, but for this cadaver model, I did. So right about now, I would check an x-ray and make sure that I'm happy with its trajectory and its length, uh, and then take the, uh, the screwdriver itself off. So here you can kind of see relative to the lamina, the top of the lamina and the pars, this is the tulip and it would line up beautifully with the screws that are below it. So now the same thing on the other side. You can start with the tap. I will start with a conical tap to expand the hole, make sure I'm happy with the start point. Once I've got that, I would typically check a ball tip probe, make sure I like the floor and all the walls of it, and then come in with the screw. And same thing, I'm starting it not necessarily parallel to the pars, but just getting it started until I have good bone purchase. Then as I'm putting this in, I'm driving it along the rostral, just kind of parallel to that rostral and medial border of it. So once I get like halfway down here, you'll see in this cadaveric demonstration, you can come in with a nerve hook or a Woodson, really feel the borders of it. And understand here, there's my screw, here's the medial border. You can kind of see where I'm hitting the medial border of the pars there. Here's the top border and I'm just hugging it. I'm following it the whole way in to make sure that I'm staying medial and staying away from that vertebral artery. So once I've got both, both of these screws down, I will often check an x-ray if I'm using fluoroscopy and make sure I'm happy with it. The one situation where I use fluoroscopy routinely is when I'm doing a C12 fusion because I use it primarily for the C1 screws. So in those situations, I'll check an x-ray at the end make sure I'm happy with the position of it. So that is how I put C2 PARS screws in under direct visualization. Those are the landmarks, the appropriate start points. You can once again see that these tulips will line up very nicely with subaxial screws if you need it. And once I've gotten all that, I'll kind of line up my uh, tulips, make sure that I make them kind of with a head turner, just kind of make sure I'm all aligned and that's perfect. That's what I want it to look like at the end when I put C2 PARS screws in to someone bilaterally. In this video, we've covered my surgical technique for placing C2 PARS screws. These screws are incredibly valuable and versatile screws in a variety of clinical scenarios. I was hoping to teach you with this video not only my technique, but also some of the relevant landmarks and local anatomy so you know how to avoid important structures and what you're specifically trying to target with a C2 PARS screw. I hope you found this surgical technique video from Spine Academy valuable, and I look forward to seeing you in videos to come.